signed by President Lyndon Johnson in 1965 to support research, education, and public programs in the humanities. Since then, the NEH awarded more than 64,000 grants, totaling $5.5 billion, and leveraged almost another $4.1 billion of additional private matching donations. These investments led to the creation of books, films, museum exhibits, and online resources for the public. For nearly the same time, Commonwealth North's mission has been to educate Alaskans on the critical public policy issues facing our state and to identify effective solutions. We believe that a strong civic education and an understanding of the institutions, institutions of government and the principles that created them are necessary to participate as responsible citizens. Thank you, John, for being here today and for your efforts to ensure that we all have the skills and knowledge necessary to thoughtfully engage in the public arena and debate the public policies that will create opportunities and improve the quality of life in all of our communities. At our head table, to my right, we have Mr. John Parrish Peaty, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. To his right is Mr. Jim Johnson, the President of the University of Alaska. To my left is Mr. Meade Treadwell, the past President of Commonwealth North, and of course, a former Lieutenant Governor. Please welcome our head here. <laughs> Commonwealth North was founded to provide a nonpartisan public policy advisory organization to help our residents better understand the most complex topics that impact our state, ranging from the gas line, health care, education, infrastructure, energy, fiscal, and now food security. Our mission is to bring forward public policy recommendations from the experts in each field that are in the best interest of all Alaskans. We fill a unique, nonpartisan niche that provides Alaskans with access to public policymakers, frank dialogue, and continual civic engagement. We bring clarity to issues free from political bias and advocate for thoughtful, deliberative development of public policy. Governors Bill Egan and Walter Hickel founded the organization in 1979 to bring together Alaskans who cared about Alaska and its future. These political opponents knew Alaska needed a clearinghouse to exchange ideas and help provide a venue for emerging leaders as they prepare for public service. Every day we see examples of extreme partisan language and actions that create barriers to good discussion and building relationships. We need your help by attending and participating in our study groups and providing your financial support by underwriting our educational activities. Would the members of Commonwealth North please stand? I'd like to personally thank you for your membership, the tremendous work you've done to educate Alaskans and our public policy leaders on Alaska's public policy challenges. Thank you. I'd also like to invite the rest of you to join Commonwealth North. If you have any questions for our speakers, please complete the question cards on your tables and hold them up for staff to collect. Please hand your questions to Jim or Aaron and we will ask them during the Q&A period at the end of the program. And now to our speaker. Mr. Petey was appointed as Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities in 2018. He holds a bachelor's degree in English from Vanderbilt University and a master's degree from Southern Studies from the University of Mississippi. After receiving his master's degree, John worked as an editor at Mercer University Press in Georgia. He focused on the humanities, literature, southern culture, and edited more than 25 books, including the st a study of Benjamin Franklin's London Years, Civil War Biographies, a photographic memoir of the Civil Rights Movement, and critical works on William Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, and many other southern writers. John's first public service work began at the National Endowment for the Arts from 2003 to 2011. He served as counselor to the National Endowment for the Arts and director of Operation Homecoming. This program helped war veterans who served in Afghanistan, Iraq, and their families write about their experiences. He later served as publisher of the Virginia Quarterly Review at the University of Virginia. John has taught community college courses and been a guest lecturer at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College, the University of Virginia, and other institutions. He has also served on the boards of several nonprofit organizations. Please help me welcome Mr. John Parrish Key. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be 
be here. Uh, when an audience shows up uh, this early, uh, it puts considerable uh, pressure on the speaker to say something of merit. Uh, but for me, honestly, the real conversation starts uh, after I make mean, some remarks uh, and you ask your questions. So I hope uh, uh, through the cards or any other way that you may ask what's on your mind. And I, I will talk about uh, city's education and a bit uh, about uh, higher education uh, on the sides of that. So first, uh, thank you, thank you for having me here at uh, Commonwealth North. Uh, my colleagues and I have been in Anchorage uh, for about four days. Uh, my colleagues uh, Carmen and Vincent here. Uh, we've been here uh, meeting with civic leaders, touring cultural sites. And we will continue on to Juno, Jahuna, uh, Katsubu. And uh, I also want to especially uh, recognize uh, the leadership of Cameron's leadership as president of the Alaska Humanities Forum. Can we just uh, acknowledge him as part of the They have uh, uh, really been a tremendous support. On, on this trip, and they are our state partners. Uh, and I'm proud to say that the Humanities Endowment has awarded nearly $8 million to them over the past decade, so they can be in every city, village, uh, uh, throughout this state. And uh, yesterday when they talked about the reach of their programming, or their grants, uh, or their projects, uh, I was thoroughly impressed. And also, uh, the last two days, uh, I've had, uh, my colleagues and I have had the hospitality of the Rasmussen uh, Foundation. I want to thank the MSC, some uh, uh, staff members here, and that's been a, a wonderful occasion as well. And as you know, our federal agency also directly funds universities, museums, cultural centers, scholars, filmmakers, libraries, and we have awarded more than $40 million to the state since our founding. For every dollar that the EDH invests, that generates about five dollars more of additional activity. So, some two hundred million dollars, uh, and that might be as uh, that might be, for example, seventy-five thousand dollars to the the seed money to the Burns documentary to be about the state, uh, the lives of Alaskans, uh, the culture of Alaska, and also a seven hundred fifty thousand dollar new challenge. Jack, the Juno Arts and Cultural Center. It's something we're, we're really excited about. And, and we're able to undertake this funding around the country because we have bipartisan support in Congress. Both parties, both houses. Our current budget of $155 million is the largest budget the endowment has had since the year 2010. And we owe a debt of gratitude to Senator Murkowski. It's been nice seeing her. Uh, two days here in Alton, Washington, and uh, through her leadership of uh, Interior has really been important. Uh, I had a meeting with Congressman Young, and he was also a supporter, he's a member of the Cultural Caucus. And there was allusion to when I was at the Arts Endowment, when I was much more of a cub, and uh, that was a time in 2003, the uh, cultural wars were winding down, uh, Chairman Joy was looking for uh, friends in Congress who were Bush administration, and uh, Senator Stevens uh, came forward, and he put a line item of a million dollars in the DOD budget for Shakespeare to tour to military bases, and uh, uh, that was something that became the start of any number of projects we did, ones that continue to this day, and so uh, so Alaska's always had uh, a, uh, a strong relationship with the endowments, and indeed, uh, Senator Steve's wife was a, uh, in the general counsel's office of the Arts Endowment uh, decades ago. So, so again, close connections, and uh, I'm glad to be here again on behalf of the government. Uh, and so, I also, as a Mississippian, I come before you in solidarity as somebody from a rural state, and as a fellow citizen who believes that the economic prosperity of a great nation is inseparable from having an informed Populist. As you know, as alluded to, the LBJ created our, our agency as part of the Great Society legislation in 1965. 
And if you read that legislation, it's an extraordinary uh, charge. And one thing that is said there is democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. And we take those words to heart. Again, democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens, not merely in our government leaders, but wisdom and vision from all of us, from citizens such as those that are gathered here today. And so this commitment, this importance of civic responsibility cannot be overstated. We can't just say that's the responsibility of K-12 teachers. It's all of us. And as chairman, I'm also driven by the words of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he was a flawed vessel to deliver some of his wisdom, but I think we all are. And he wrote a letter some 200 years ago, and Jefferson said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and will never be. At the any age, we're focused on civic education across our seven funding categories, including cultural infrastructure, because we realize that you cannot have freedom separate from knowledge. You cannot have knowledge separate from the humanities. And in our nation, as in many nations, honestly, we are, it seems to me, often in a time of cultural nation. And we must take concrete steps to address this issue. It's a global epidemic with clear, harmful societal implications. Think of the consequences, for example, of a world that has forgotten the horror of the Holocaust. And I say that as today we'll be going to the uh, Jewish Museum here. Think about what cultural amnesia means when in our own lifetime there are generations who do not understand it, do not believe certain things came to pass in the 20th century. And then there are clear cultural challenges, or challenges, sometimes often budgetary challenges, for cultural organizations, and of course, by extension, higher education. And I won't uh, go through all of it. Um, I, I write my own speeches, and I have three or four speeches that I've written in the last year that I really like. And I've tried to put them all into one speech here, so we'll see if that works. But the downside of that means that I'm going to gloss a few topics that I often spend pages on. But I, but I wanted to. Uh, raise a few points so that we might have a conversation. Uh, so first, and, and again, this is a partial list, but we must be realistic about the economic pressures on institutions of higher learning. Even as we resist the replacement of a tenure-based faculty system, for example, with an unsustainable adjunct teaching uh, apparatus. And, and the cultural argument I want to make is that the humanities are most relevant when they are in the public square, not just functioning on our campuses. If the humanities live only within the campus walls, then that's an impoverished vision of the humanities. They're not only terribly democratic, because there's a lot of people that are going to go through life outside of the four-year uh, university system. And there are a lot of people who had that experience at a young part of the age, but we want to make sure at age 30, 40, 50, 60, and beyond, <coughs> humanities are part of one's life. And, and I do worry, I will say, sometimes about the direction of the modern university when it's not rooted in the humanities. And I mean rooted. I mean anchored down to the foundation of the free exchange of ideas. And last, uh, uh, in, the, in the spring, I went to 20 campuses, and we had the government shut down their vector agency. So I went to 20 campuses, uh, at least a dozen states, maybe 15 states, in 60 days. So every three days for, uh, for 60 days, I went to a different campus. And we had a lot of conversations about the decline of, say, history majors. And my point is, we don't all have to major in the liberal arts to have them in our lives. And I was at uh, a university in Texas, a uh, well respected national leader. And uh, the dean was walking me to a meeting with faculty. And uh, we talked about the humanities. He said his, his engineers and his computer science faculty had come from him. They said, we're turning out great at graduates, but they don't have the broad educational base we wish they did. And so they came up with the idea of creating a new class on ethics and technology. And their goal was to short notice create a class. Um, they did not meet their goal. They did not create one class. They created four classes, at which point they ran out of 
uh, philosophers on campus who were available. And that class uh, became so important, they're talking about creating an institute, they're actually looking at using this ethics and technology class as a way to distinguish them from other competitors. And, and, and it's about having uh, that kind of flexibility, even in the midst of, of enrollment pressures and other, other pressures. And one part about, uh, when I think about my own undergraduate education, somebody who's a chemist who switched my last year of college to English, and I fell in love with it late because my university put its best teachers in those introductory classes. And sometimes I worry about how we're approaching undergraduate education. I, I believe to lead in a classroom, you should be an expert in the field, absolutely. But we should not get so narrow in our academic interests that we are no longer focus on conveying knowledge in a general sense. In my own field of literary criticism, I worry we have spent so much energy dissecting the body of work that we have failed to tell people how much we love it. As everyday people, we do not read to unpack metaphors, but because we love to read, because it deepens our understanding of the world. It creates empathy in us, and it enables us to go about our lives as more informed citizens. We must embrace a greater knowledge of global culture and world heritage, for example, even as we strengthen efforts to preserve and promote those unique cultural assets to distinguish our individual states, our individual nation, including the customs and traditions of our indigenous people. And I will say that we must, in the university and in our society, support the advancement of technology, even as we hold fast to the absolute requirement that the humanistic field of ethics, including bioethics, must be at the decision-making center, especially in light of growth of artificial intelligence, for example, and the pervasive and often negative influence of social media or societal norms. And in that sense, uh, we must get back to the humanity idea of being in community and of community. If we are to successfully tackle these issues, we must be passionate about policy making in the right place for that. And, and, but how does one translate passion into policy? Well, first I would say you have to outline the values from which your policy decisions emanate. And when I came to the endowment, was running it for about a year before my uh, Senate confirmation, and I outlined in my first speech the values of the agency during my tenure. And we have, we have stuck to these values. Those are the values I inherited but I wanted to give them a name. And so I would say our policy decisions come out of the fact that our agency is committed to unfettered access to knowledge, the primacy of critical reasoning, apolitical research, scholarship, content, mutual respect in our interactions, and robust dialogues where we do not set up straw men as substitutes for those of goodwill who see the world in sharply different terms than we do. In short, we must hold fast to the best traditions of the humanities. Now, on the matter of how to interact with policy, decision makers who differ from our own, and I realize in the state you've had no issues of this nature, you know, uh, this year, but I remember the first time I, I staffed Chairman Julia, David Julia, a poet, uh, business leader, and, uh, and a friend of mine, and a mentor, and we were going to Capitol Hill. Uh, and as we stepped out of the car, uh, it was our first visit to the Hill together, and he said, John, there are only two types of people in that building, our friends and our future friends. And if you don't uh, get that, you don't work for me. Now, over the 15 years that have followed, I spent a lot of time with future friends of the arts and the humanities, <laughs> I must say. Uh, but they give me a greater appreciation for our common endeavor because of their skepticism. It's, you know, if we just go to the amen corner all the time, uh, it makes these speeches pleasurable, all right, checks, take photographs, but, but these are public dollars and we should be challenged, it seems to me, on, on how we use them. I think it's appropriate. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, but yes, it's also nice to be friends of the hill too. And, and, uh, as I have uh, this whole week. And once one establishes one's values, then of course you listen a 
then you observe, and then you act. And we have been acting a great deal at the agency of our state partners. And so I want to know in practical terms uh, the vital importance of a strong cultural sector to a diversified state and regional economy. And, and by doing so, I want to underscore the value of the humanities to our communities. Alaska, of course, is heavily dependent upon the energy sector for its prosperity, for example. And the ups and downs of the market impact whether you maintain talented school teachers, maintain a good highway system, offer competitive retirement plans for state employees, and other general services. And with, and with such an abundance of natural resources, Alaska is playing to its strengths as it should. I would add that the arts and the humanities are your strength, too. Indeed, your unique cultural assets, whether it's sports fishing, hunting, hiking, whether it's uh, Glacier Bay National Park, are also wonderful strengths uh, and a continually renewable strength. And this industry is not at the mercy of the marketplace. It cannot be dashed to the rocks because of a change in federal regulation or the impact of trade dispute or the discovery of untapped oil fields in the Gulf of Mexico or on my area of the nation or any other place. Culture, when supported by community and government and civic leaders, is a stable and dynamic and irreplaceable economic engine that enriches the lives of citizens, even as it enriches them financially. And, and let's put numbers to it. When I talk about the humanities, I don't say, you know, believe in the humanities because it's good for your soul, but I believe it is. But it's an economic argument as well. So according to the US, US Bureau of Economic Analysis, the arts and cultural sector is a $730 billion industry. That represents 4.2% of our nation's GDP. That is larger than the share of, uh, of the economy in transportation, agriculture, and construction. Think about that. Every single piece of commerce that travels by a boat, a plane, an 18-wheeler, any form of transportation, a train across this nation, all of that is smaller than the arts and cultural sector. Now that's the commercial sector, the nonprofit sector. And because uh, tourism is reported separate, then arts and culture, the overall impact of the sector is actually much, much larger. To put it in perspective for your state, 11,000 people in Alaska are involved, in, are employed in the cultural industry, and this adds $1.4 billion to your economy. Culture is big business, culture is good business. The question I have, and really can be only answered by you, by, by uh, those you work with, those you know, those who are in your community. The question I have is, what is being done to nurture the cultural sector, to grow it, to capitalize on it, to promote it far and wide? Are you claiming it? And if so, how, to what extent? Are you looking to Native Alaskan culture as foundational to the state's culture? not merely your past, but your future too. What are you doing to integrate the cultural sector into the education and the lives of young people who will take over running the state if they are retained through their young and old years? The creative economy is not only the future, it is the present, and it is in many ways the ongoing historic past. And I wanna be clear that I'm not just advocating for a diversified economy, or for an economy that draws heavily upon your cultural and nat natural assets. I am saying also that we as a nation need to attend to such assets because if we do not, slowly but surely, we will lose our way. We will lose any deep and abiding understanding of our nation's founding ideals. We will lose touch with what President Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. The culture the humanities is the culture of resilience, is the culture of knowledge, of tolerance, of inclusion, of diversity, including ideological diversity. Your presence here means that you understand the humanities' value and its fragility, and you are committed to shoring it up. The humanities, and I make this point over and over, and it bears saying, bears saying in every room, the humanities are not a luxury. They are not frivolous, they are not divisive, 
Rather, the humanities are what bind us together in our common journey. There is nothing more clearly in the wheelhouse of the humanities, the universities, the arts, or, for example, than uniting people to the development of their minds. The humanities unveil lives, reveal cultures, explain nations to themselves and to the world. As the United States approaches the year 2026, which marks the 250th anniversary of nationhood of our founding, NEH encourages projects to promote a deeper understanding of American history and culture and that advances civics education and knowledge through our core principles of government. I won't go into all that now, but we create a special office focused on the 250th. We're part of the City Quincentennial Commission created by Congress, and we are reorientating our educational website excitement to make sure that our lessons plans, which 2.5 million teachers and homeschooling parents read a year, free educational materials provided by the government, that we're making sure the telling of our history in a comprehensive way uh, is, is part of the agency's mission. And as humanists, we must see our duty is not only preserving artifacts or underwriting research or presenting exhibitions and films, but it's a nearly sacred duty of pointing the way to the next generation so they too can live meaningful, impactful, fulfilling lives. So in closing, I want to say that I read the same newspaper articles you do. I see the same studies, I see the same pressures on state budgets, on enrollment numbers. I see the same research about maybe a decline in civic engagement in many places across the nation. I understand this uncertainty and the anxiety of it. I have a, a college-age daughter. I said, think about what she's going to do after education. So I see it. I'm immersed in it, too. I understand it. And yet, I'm an optimist. I have a low tolerance for all forms of defeatism. There is always a way forward. You just have to push. You have to have a vision and the power to bring that vision to be. And that power is always going to come from a sense of community, a commitment to community. I have long been in all the Reinhold Niebuhr as a theologian, as a witness, as a citizen of the highest order. And rereading his essay, Optimism, Pessimism, and Religious Faith, Niebuhr discusses what he calls the self-destruction of modern optimism. He's writing this between the world and wars. And he writes, history does not move forward without catastrophe. Happiness is not guaranteed by the multiplication of physical comforts. Social harmony is not easily created by more intelligence. And human nature is not as good or as harmless as had been supposed. Those are sobering words. Again, he was in Europe between the wars. He saw what was coming. Very sobering wars. And I believe he hits the mark here. And yet, how many of us in this room have optimism precisely because of humanists such as Niebuhr, because of citizens such as Niebuhr, because of books such as his books? Reviewing the NEH funded Library of American collection of Niebuhr, the scholar Ronald Stone said that this specific essay represented, quote, penultimate pessimism and ultimate optimism. I like that phrasing. May we always restrict our pessimism to the penultimate position. As I have said, I am an optimist, have always been an optimist, will always be an optimist. Every grant maker is at heart an optimist. And because you're here in this room, on this day, for this reason, I cannot help but think, in spite of all the barriers, you are an optimist too. Now, speaking here on the frontier of a continent, I find the same values, have found the same values on my trips here as I found in my, same, in my own native state. The pride of place, the commitment to community, a love of language, a vibrant urge to not merely be, but to belong forever and always. In short, in Alaska, I have found a people filled with hard-won optimism. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. That was um, 
you know, you uh, touched on so many uh, uh, great themes, and you know, one of the things that uh, you reinforced uh, uh, for me as a recent example, my uh, daughter, uh, went back, uh, she's a 16-year-old uh, girl, and went back to uh, uh, serve as a page here this in July. And, uh, you know, all teenagers are in their phone. You can't get them up out of their phone. And the, uh, and one of the rules is, is that when you show up, you have to check in your phone until the weekend. You can't, in fact, I think it's permanent. You can't, until you're, until you're done serving as a page, you're, you're done. You, you've got to be aware. You've got to be there and present. And um, the fun part of that experience for uh, um, my daughter um, and my wife and I was that she reinforced the fact that they had to engage. And, and the kids, when they came back at night and they spoke about what they were discussing on the Senate, on the Senate floor, and that was, you know, it, it just reinforced um, the fact that we've got to, you know, get out of this passive, you know, uh, um, uh, way of, 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 of the kids talking and, 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 and getting self-absorbed and find ways to use the technology to reinforce culture and, and dialogue and all the other things. So it's uh, uh, just a really uh, appreciated your your, uh, your notes and uh, looking forward to the questions that are coming forward. Um, I'd also like to uh, take a moment to thank a couple of special guests that uh, showed up, and I apologize for not doing this earlier, but um, Representative Jennifer Johnston, uh, thank you for, uh, for attending this morning. Uh, Dina Bishop, our ASD superintendent, and uh, Mr. Nicholas Abramchek, uh, Director of Federal Affairs, National Endowment for the Arts, um, and he hails from Palmer. So uh, thank you for attending um, this well, morning. Well, sorry. Thank you. Once again, I'm moving Palmer. That's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. It is, it is. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, well, thank you, and thank you for it, because we know that you had some trouble uh, getting here, and thank you for making it happen. So, um, uh, so a couple of the, the early questions that we've got, uh, Jim and Aaron, are, uh, if you have a question, please hold up your card, and uh, we'll bring them forward. Uh, has um, uh, uh, worked to preserve national languages, and you put these traditional native um, uh, uh, cultures back on the map. Um, what help is the NDH giving to assist this cause um, as uh, these traditions and languages uh, disappear. Uh, it's, it's one of those themes of culture and we have to live it, right? Absolutely, and uh, I have a folder here with a list of uh, a number of grants and I uh, might grab one page out of it for, for later, but if we do a couple of things. Um, thank you, Carl. Uh, so, Two things. For decades, the National Endowment for Humanities and the National Science Foundation have partnered on a project uh, called Documenting Endangered Languages. Now, these are languages all over the world, some that still exist, some uh, that do not uh, have EDE speakers left. Uh, they were recorded in the early 20th century uh, when the last individual was passed. Uh, that was historically our role. We still do that, and that's about preserving the work. Um, and migrating old tapes, real to real tapes, to websites, meta tagging, you know, when you go online, the more uh, sustainable uh, uh, use of that resource, and also discoverability on, on the website for scholars, uh, for, for people who want to get in touch with their own history. What we're doing uh, a lot more, uh, and particularly uh, in Alaska, uh, is language revitalization. The idea of multi multi generational uh, uh, transition of, of knowledge, so that an elder is saying it to somebody who's my age, is saying it to a thirty year old, is saying it to a twenty year old, to, to uh, an elementary age student, that that you have uh, the continu continuation of a whole culture. At the same time, these stories are being told; they're also being documented. Uh, we have worked with a number of indigenous people across the nation who have never had a dictionary, for example, have never had a written record of their work. I, I was in the um, Badlands in South Dakota for four or five days with the Dakota, we were talking about projects we were doing there, uh, with a Crow uh, Indian, um, we were on 
Crow Agency and talking about uh, uh, the way they have used some of our fund money for formal or history projects, but also they are bringing in some of the elders and maybe if you're uh, a Crow at 20 or 30 years of age, you might know one or two words for salad, but the older members had a, a much larger vocabulary for something such as that, it was so central. And it's a, kind of a speed race of, you know, uh, working through titles for all the different ways that all the trees uh, might, might have been named or known. And so uh, what we're doing is, is getting out of the way and letting the people in the organization <coughs> define what they want to do with that funding. Sometimes the, the tribes come to us directly, sometimes nonprofits come on their behalf. We also gave a $2.1 million plan to the First Nation Development Fund, uh, which is also leading some of the uh, language revitalization projects. So I won't uh, uh, go into each, each group in the fund level, but, but that's something that's been at the heart of the agency for more than 40 years. And uh, part of this trip is to create greater awareness of that. And again, I want to commit the forum for its uh, connections with making sure these indigenous forces have place for Very good, thank you. Do you mind if I share a success in English? Uh, I'm not sure if everyone's aware that we have the first indigenous <coughs> language in the United States um, in an immersion school. And uh, we do true immersion where uh, half the kids stay. Um, sorry, we got our teacher from the University of Fairbanks. Um, but uh, <laughs> children, uh, first year was last year kindergarten, and uh, if students in the class are, are of all cultures, and um, we will carry this through 12th grade to uh, its big big language. So uh, first in the nation, Indigenous Language Immersion School, and it was supported by federal grants. So thank you. Thank you. So I have a uh, question regarding uh, uh, restrictive funding sources and uh, uh, how do we uh, work to enhance and promote uh, civic education um, in restricted budgets and what are some ideas that, um, that are really working well um, outside of Alaska that we might be able to bring forward? Um, sure, and I'm going to take restricted budget, I mean not restricted endowment dollars, but just uh, budgets that lean budgets. Yes. Uh, so a couple things. I, I mentioned the excitement website. Uh, that's something we've, we've had for decades at the endowment. It was always funded through uh, private companies, and so the staff is always tied to a particular brand. And when I came on, uh, you know, I felt we, we had to get on. We had to say this is a core cool part of what we're doing. We had to hire uh, uh, federal full-time employees that were going to oversee this. So one thing is if we're doing forward in the right manner, uh, that those free education materials are there. And, uh, and the idea is that you can tell a national story, and then uh, this, you can add a state story to that. And I also, my perspective from federal funding uh, is that we want to make a catalytic investment, but I honestly don't want to see a grant that's 100% federal, because that means maybe there isn't the local body. So, uh, so a way that that functions, for example, when, when I came on as chairman, uh, I guess I was acting chairman at the time when I went to Nebraska, and they were celebrating the 150th anniversary of statehood, and I thought, well, we should have a grant for that. Congress allows me a line item to give a grant outside of any uh, grant categories up to $30,000. So a modest, you go somewhere, you see a project, you don't want to wait a year, two years for the right thing to happen. Uh, you know, we, can, uh, we can have that conversation. So uh, I just put up when all the states were founded, and I thought, well, every, I was acting chairman, I didn't know how long I had to do this, so I thought, I'll, I'll just go forward five years, six years, and every state that's gonna have a bicentennial in that time, a centennial or 150, we're gonna get grants to. And uh, so that ended up being the, the end of America, the bicentennial. So it was Maine, Illinois, and the Mississippi Territory, which say Mississippi and Alabama. It's just an accident that it was Mississippi. It wasn't me cheering, but I did not, you know, but cheering for the home state. But here's what happened. As you know, I know quite well for a, a number of reasons. 
uh, the state legislatures fund the arts councils, uh, in general do not fund the humanities councils, it's a difference in the way they're structured. Uh, so I was celebrating Illinois and Mississippi, and if you know, the largest peacetime migration in the 20th century was African Americans leaving the Jim Crow South, north was called the Great Migration. So I was in Illinois doing a podcast, radio show, and they were talking about the Chicago bluesman and Muddy Waters. I said, yes, I, the Mississippi bluesman and Muddy Waters. And, and we talked about B.B. King, this idea that you know, the, the music of my state was the music of Chicago. Well, in Alabama, limited resources, the state legislature doesn't uh, uh, fund the Humanities Council. And so I gave them a $30,000 chairman's grant. They picked part of the Alabama history they wanted to tell. They made these displays that go to various cities. And everybody loved it. And the Tours uh, Commission said, well, we'd like five more. And they said, well, that's not, the federal dollars don't go that far. Or we would like this to be permanent. Well, that's not the quality it was printed at. Uh, it's a temporary bicentennial. And what uh, they realized is that this Arts Council wasn't the right group to tell the history. That's not how they're trained. The state library system, that wasn't quite their charge. It's not the charge of the state education system. It's only the state humanities that, that does as they often have the online encyclopedia for the state. So the state legislature did a one-time appropriation. I haven't looked at that number in a while. I think it was about 300,000, about 10 to 1 matched our grant because the idea is they wanted to tell their history in a particular way. So I believe as we move forward to the year 2026, we can make those kind of catalytic investments, and then we turn it over to local decision makers. Do you want to tell your story, or do you want to have somebody from the outside tell it for you? Or worse yet, do you want your story to go untold altogether? And so uh, we can make meaningful investments in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And any state is always eligible to come in to our educational applications, to uh, uh, create online resources, classroom resources. And so we have all those categories available at the time. But I think my, my charge as chairman is to get out there. I, I will be in 40 states in the last 18 months uh, by, by December. And we're always finding there's something going on in the state that we feel like, let's make that investment, get it up and running, and then look for a larger grant to come forward in the future. Okay. So we have a question on higher education. Um, there's uh, the role of uh, universities, they play multiple roles, right? Um, workforce development and, and uh, as being one of their, one of their roles. The, uh, there's, there could be a perception by some that, um, that it's overly biased um, uh, towards one or the other and, and that the uh, a true college education that, that most of us have experienced um, can be perceived as elitist and, and kind of put barriers in there. Um, how do we, um, uh, or do you have any recommendations on how to make um, uh, the Europe university system and open so that, that uh, it's more welcoming, um, I guess, and it crosses some of those, um, those barriers that might that some people perceive. Sure. Um, well, I, I think you're fortunate that you're in a state where the, uh, the educational system, the university system, understands who it serves. That, uh, that it is trying to strengthen communities. Uh, support uh, the state and, and, and provide a livelihood to, to the students as they go forth in careers. So um, I, I think when we talk about universities and perception of elitism, I think we're often talking about uh, private universities. You know, uh, in other words, uh, uh, I, I go to universities where the acceptance rate is 7%, 10%, you know, this idea that when you're turning down 90% of all the people that, that seek to attain an education, it reinforces a, a sense of elitism. And so when you have a state with a strong public university system, uh, I, I think that that's not as much of the issue as elitism. That doesn't mean that, uh, that there isn't the reality of student loan debt. That doesn't mean that there isn't the complexity of being a working adult. Uh, often a working parent. 
transparent, and we certainly need to talk about online resources, other ways uh, that we can help people, credentialing people when they're in fields that, that need a degree to pursue their activity. Um, the part I think about a lot is, are the humanities seen as either elite, elitist or, or frivolous? And, and that's not my experience. Um, when I, um, I was talking to the leaders, the leaders at Union Pacific Railroad on time uh, in Omaha, and uh, in this job, and they need a lot of engineers. So this is a, what, Fortune 100 company, they need a lot of engineers, they need a lot of computer scientists. And uh, by the time that graduates a couple years out of college, all the knowledge is obsolete. They're gonna teach them what they need to know as engineers. What they are not going to do is ever invest in that person to make up for four years of a lack of privilege that they that's not their job. It's not realistic. You don't retain an employee that long. So the idea of making your own decisions, of, of having a level of discernment, uh, that matters. There's a reason when uh, uh, part of my bio, you know, seven years of, uh, at the Arch Endowment, you know, I was here, uh, Ellendorf, Richardson, I was in Afghanistan, Kurgerson, Bahrain, Persian Gulf, Walter Reed Hospital, 30 something domestic bases. And, uh, we would, you, we would take something that was the core humanities. We would take homework. We would talk about belonging to war and all that. I, we would take a passage and then a World War I poem and then somebody would tell me about the second battle of Fallujah. I mean, we've almost forgotten Fallujah. We don't even know how to break it down between what it was, you know, um, you know the fire of the second one. It's extraordinary. The book, they, they sent us 10,000 pages for that National Library of the Arts Project. That endeavor continues as creative forces. When we went to print the paperbacks, we had to update it with people who were killed between the printings of the book. So every time I'm in a room, I know the humanities are not in any way elite. What I know is they're foundational. And uh, I've seen that with people and how works that are thousands of years old help people get through the trauma of what they've experienced. Um, when we were doing that project, uh, there was a World War II poet, um, who's, we had an auto recording for that, Shelby Foote, you know, uh, Shelby's latest life, he didn't want to do the interview, but uh, you know, I said I'm in Mississippi, and he said, all right, you're in the tribe, so I have to do this interview. And he talked about World War II, uh, Richard Wilbur, um, the great poet Lewis Simpson, not necessarily a well-known poet, but he has a poem about being at the Battle of the Bulge, and it ends when he says, and I'm still on the rim of that. This is a man in his 80s when we interviewed him, and he talked about still being on the rim, looking down into that. And so uh, I think what we need to do is, is talk about the humanities um, at an almost visceral level, right? Um, and, and the, um, the way that we have seen in our, our families, you know, of meeting with people, you know, the Rasmussen's had a, a lot of founders in, and how many people that are leaders in national organizations and were one generation has been college educated. You know, my, my father's a son of a steel mill worker in Alabama, and because he gets a scholarship to Vanderbilt as I would a generation later, he was on the edges of the room the first heart transplant on earth happened. He would have never had that. If, and there's some tough Catholic nuns in elementary school involved too, you know. Uh, but but um, the idea that the humanities implant in us, not just an understanding of our past, but an imagined future for ourselves, they get us through. And so um, I sometimes think at universities, you know, the missions counselors are largely, you know, they just graduated from college, they're 22, they're 23, 24. Uh, I wish our best professors would go and just meet with the missions counselors right before. We have a Phi Beta Kappa a faculty on campus, they might all come together. Because those students have just been taught the humanities maybe a little bit, and they're certainly talking to guidance counselors and parents who are about student loan debt. They haven't reached our age. By the time you reach middle age and beyond, you've had such complexities, loss, death, setbacks, great loves. Um, the humanities help us sort it out. 
art and music and books. And uh, the ones who talk to prospective students and parents about what a university life might be, they simply haven't had all that. I understand they've had great tragedies or fearful school shootings. I'm not being naive again. I have a teenager myself. I'm just saying that they haven't accumulated all the years. And uh, they don't know how much they need the mechanism of the humanities in their lives as a reservoir strength. Uh, so um, properly articulated, properly understood the humanities are this wealth of presence. We're good, thank you. And uh, we're, uh, what? Time for one more question, and, uh, and then we'll move to a close. Uh, how would you suggest we integrate humanities into business uh, in real time at, at every level? Uh, in the, with the follow up, uh, what do you think of the recent CEO statement at the business round? So, either so that I don't misunderstand that statement, or if there are others in the room who don't have that statement, can somebody? what that statement was. They, they redefined the purpose of a corporation to be about the greater good as opposed to just the bottom Right, right. Uh, we've been... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah I, I saw that at the top of the Washington Post yesterday. We're, uh, this is seventh city in 10 days, four states, so I'm, I'm catching news sometimes a, a bit behind. Um, right, the idea that the shareholders is, is not uh, the only metric. Uh, so, first, there have always been corporations that have felt that way. Um, and, uh, and I guess I would say, I would, know, I would want to know how that plays out. Uh, and uh, I think we had that more. I won't say when we had company towns, its own issue, but when you were rooted to place, when you went to, you're a corporate, corporate leader, you went to school, most people, you went to, you know, your house of worship, if that was part of your tradition, you were educated, and, and corporations had a place, uh, uh, and even global corporations had a place. I go to museums a great deal, I've been part of 50 museums the last two years, you know, you know, if you want to look at the great glass collections, you go to corporate. You know, and, and uh, uh, you know, there are particular industries uh, that have museums, symphonies, even other uh, reflect in some ways of value. I think um, responsible stewardship uh, is not only a morally good idea, but it's good business. Um, that if giving a choice of comparable services I want um, to do business with one who is going to leave my community stronger and um, is, is going to leave a world that I would like my daughter to be able to live in. I, I believe that um, our business relationships you know, can be intimate ideas. I have a lot of friends who own independent bookstores. The amount of times they say somebody will come in and literally ask them, do you know if Amazon has this, you know, and, and, and they find the book there, they want to see it in person, and they're going to go order it online. You know, I have no opinion about Amazon. If you live in a geographically isolated place, again, a lot of places in Mississippi, it wasn't that the small mom and pop store was driven out by a large, large group. The mom and pop store was never there to start with because these are hamlets and villages, and, and, and the state has that as well. So um, sometimes uh, local groups are going to be Placed, um, uh, and that's and sometimes all the needs we have simply aren't local. But uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see how it lives out. Is that enough on point? I don't know about cover. Yeah. Okay. And are, and are you available to stay afterwards for a few minutes, or do you have obligations right afterwards? I. Okay. Uh, I have. A, I will make that available. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, let me say, so though, we have a, a, an interview with the newspaper, and, and that's another point, is just having cultural coverage is always a so I'm glad that the newspaper here, we have two in Juno, is that tomorrow? Uh, so so that's, that's encouraging, too. Uh, you know, I have, this whole binder is full of nothing but the grants we've given 
just in the last 18 months in the state. And you should have this in the newspapers right next to the, the other articles you might be reading, because this is happening well. 